Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your break. Our first speaker for this session will be David Rowlandson. He will be talking. He will be giving an introduction to causal inference with Python. I'd like to welcome you on stage. Yeah, hopefully that's going to pop up. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, great to be here, and um, I'm really excited to be talking to you today about causal inference with Python. It's a topic that I've been increasingly passionate about over the last few years because I've seen sort of how much it can really impact the way that we do data science and machine learning in industry. And this talk's going to kind of have two parts. The first part, I'm going to try and convince you that you also should be interested and passionate about causal inference and more broadly causality. And then in the second part, we're going to work through a simple example with a Python library called DoY, which enables you to calculate you know, cause and effect um, in Python. So as soon as you start sort of looking into um, causal inference, uh, you'll encounter this term causality. And at first, it seems like it's a bit of a sort of nebulous concept. And really, it, it, it kind of doesn't have a very specific definition. It sort of encompasses a range of topics around the science of cause and effect. And this is a, a topic that actually is everywhere. There are many questions that you'll encounter in you know, a data science role which are inherently causal. And you know, if you look out for the, the words in red here, like what would happen if, or why did this happen? Like, I call these questions inherently causal because to answer them properly, you really need an understanding of causation, not just association or correlation. Well, what's interesting is that most of the machine learning models that you'll encounter are not explicitly causal, even when they're trying to address these causal questions. And one of the things I often encounter talking to sort of particularly machine learning and AI people is, well, can't you do predictions with an associative model? And it's true, you can. I mean, that, that's one of their sort of core capabilities. But What's different is with a causal model, you're more likely to get accurate answers when you are asking questions in a changed context. So the statistics of the data that you're going to use the model in are going to be different for some reason. And that difference can disrupt an associative model, but hopefully a causal model will be able to handle those disruptions because of the causal modeling. So for example, if you're going to make an intervention, which is like a change to the system, then that's going to change the statistics, and you want the model to be able to deal with that, then a causal model would be preferable. Um, and of course, it may be not an intervention that you're making, but an intervention that you can't control, such as climate change. You're aware that it's coming, and you can sort of have a bit of an understanding of the effects that it might have, and you want to model that. In uh, in a lot of research that we see, particularly sort of observational studies, um, we often see a, a statement like, you know, doing X may reduce the risk of Y. And, you know, th this, this guy um, on Twitter or X or whatever it is this week, um, he, he said, you know, this is an explicitly causal statement, but then later on in the paper you've got a statement like, oh, well, you know, this is just an associational study, so you can't actually say anything about cause, or cause and effect. Um, so it's almost like, you know, Schrodinger's cat, right, where the study is in two states at the same time. You know, you're wanting to draw this sort of causal conclusion, but you know you're not allowed to say that. So I feel like there's a sort of, you know, internal contradiction. And you know, if people were aware that it is actually quite easy to embrace and add thinking about causality into these studies, then they would do it a lot more often. And it's not just the researchers maybe sort of hedging their bets about whether the research is covering causality or not. Um, there's also been research into the perceptions that people draw from associative studies. Like, if they read that, you know, there's an association between X and Y, people often draw the conclusion that X causes Y, which, you know, may be true, but it may also not be true. And in fact, there's you know, a huge number of examples showing that you know, it, it very easily can be a sort of spurious or false correlation. In fact, this, this guy, Tyler Vegan, the website at the bottom there, yeah, he's got a whole website full of hilarious sort of correlations that don't have any real causal relation, just to show how easy it is to discover you know, a, a false relationship. There is one uh, experimental design that people widely understand do establish a causal relationship, and that's called the randomized controlled trial, and, 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 or RCT. 
And an RCT has two key elements that enable it to do that. The first is randomization. So whatever the factors that you know, affect that whole study population, they're going to be present in both groups that you produce. Because you randomize the assignment of people to those two groups, uh, whatever those confounding factors are, they're going to be present in both groups. And then you make some intervention or change to just one of those groups. And then that enables the combination of the random assignment and that change to just one of the groups allows you to make that conclu conclusion that the, the differences between those groups are due to the intervention. And they're not due to other factors that were sort of hidden in the background. But randomized controlled trials are not always pro possible. They're not always practical. So for example, if your question is about something that's happened in the past, and obviously, unless you can time travel, you can't go back and change that and see what would have happened. Um, there are also many situations where it's you know, unethical or impractical to do a randomized controlled trial. So for example, you can't get you know, a group of kids and then get half of them to smoke 20 cigarettes a day for 20 years to sort of see what might happen. So, if you can't do a randomized control trial, can you still model causality? And the answer is yes. You basically need these two things. So first, you need some data. And secondly, you need a causal model. And there's many types of causal model. Uh, but most commonly, the way that you produce the model is either by drawing on the knowledge of experts. And that process of sort of gathering and sort of discussing and teasing out that knowledge is called elicitation. Or you can learn the causal model from the data, and that's called causal discovery. So causal inference is the process of you know, using the model once you've got it. Discovery is the process of learning a model from data, and elicitation is the process of learning a model from experts. And there can be a bit of mixing, right? Like you can get some expert domain knowledge and use that to restrict the range of models for causal discovery. So in my day job, I work for WSP, um, an engineering consulting company. And what's really sort of drawn me to the sort of causality space is just the number of opportunities that we encounter where we have clients with vast quantities of detailed historical data. And because a lot of these are sort of you know, infrastructure engineering systems, they also have expert domain knowledge of these well-defined, well-controlled systems. And the types of questions that they come to us and ask us to solve are often causal questions. So, for example, in you know, managing a lot of the sort of critical infrastructure that we have around Australia, um, we get questions like, you know, over the last 10 years, we've invested X millions of dollars in uh, applying these policies to renew like, pipe networks or road networks. You know, if we had invested a different amount of money or if we'd invested in different practices or policies or technologies, what would have happened? Like, what would have been the service level of our railways or our roads under those conditions? And so all of these questions, they generally, they're causal questions because they involve yeah, exploring the outcomes that would have happened under different conditions that aren't represented in the data. So that was the first part of the talk where I try to sort of convince you that you should be interested in, in causality. The second part is sort of looking specifically at a Python library called DoY, which I've been working with quite a bit. And uh, DoY is part of a, uh, a package, well, not a package, uh, an ecosystem, they call it, um, called PyY, which contains a few major packages. DoY, which is about causal effects, uh, EconML. Um, a lot of the people working in the causal inference space come from econometrics and epidemiology. And so they brought in a lot of their methods. And causal learn is called discovery algorithms. And this talk is going to mostly focus on the do why part. And um, do why is, is well documented. The user guide, it, it's all on Pi Y. And actually, you know, the user guide is not just the bare bones of, um, you know, this is, this is how you install it, this is how you, you, how you do one simple introduction. It's actually pretty detailed. It covers a lot of sort of background concepts. So it's a really quite a recommended read. I'm going to show a few clips of code um, for the rest of the talk. And um, that's actually in a public GitHub repo, which I just made for this talk. So if you want to go have a look at that afterwards, then you can, um, you can have a look at you know, what's happened, play with the code, like maybe do some experiments of your own. So everything there is very simple. One of the things I really like about do why is that uh, it imposes this sort of four-step process on modeling a sort of causal inference problem. And uh, the, the four steps are, firstly, model the problem. And I'll explain what these are as, as we go. Uh, secondly, we'll use that model to identify an estimand. 
We use the S demand and your data to estimate an effect. And then finally, the fourth step, where we will try to refute that estimate. OK, so to try and explain what those words all mean, we'll go through a bit of an example. The example that I picked is uh, called the Lalonde uh, data set. It's, it's really old. It was, um, you know, it's from, I think, the, the late 1970s. And um, it's very simple, uh, small data set. Um, and uh, essentially what had happened is they had a training program, and they wanted to understand if that training program had actually produced a benefit to the people who uh, participated in it. And so they looked at the wages of participants uh, three years later in 1978, and they compared to another group of, of people who hadn't participated in that program. And so the question, so the data you can see there, this, this data is in the, uh, in the repo. Uh, essentially, there's two columns that we're really interested in, you know, whether they undertook the training and then their wage three years later, which was 1978. I told you it was a very old example. Um, and, and there's a few other columns, which are sort of variables that they thought may have also uh, affected the answer. So remember I said that to do causality without randomized controlled trials, you need two things. So firstly, you need some data, and we just looked at that CSV file. And then secondly, you need a, a causal model. And so the next thing we need to look at is how you can describe a causal model in DoY, the Python library. So do why it wants you to provide your domain knowledge about the system in question as a directed acyclic graph. Directed meaning that um, there are uh, arrows, essentially, between the variables. And the variables are just like the columns in your data file, effectively, right? So, and acyclic means that there are no loops, right? So those, those are the only sort of constraints that we have. We need that graph to include at least the treatment, which is the, the cause that we want to vary, and the outcome that we want to you know, understand the effect on the outcome, right? There is this aim that you want to include in that graph all of the relevant direct causal relationships. So you don't want to include just a you know, a correlation. You only want to include a relationship where it's a causal one. We, there's a bit of sort of judgment and sort of expediency, practicality to sort of deciding which uh, variables and which interactions to include. Uh, that is a whole sort of topic in itself. But, um, you know, one tip I can give is like you can always create multiple models and compare um, the results with different models. One of the great things about creating this graph is that it becomes a specific, precise, documented description of your assumptions and beliefs that you're bringing to this study. So whereas if you'd just done one of those Schrodinger's um, uh, studies and before, like essentially all of this would have not been stated, right? Whatever assumptions you make about confounding variables is just kind of left for the reader to sort of interpret. Whereas if you embrace causality and you sort of draw a causal diagram, a, a DAG like this, then you're making those assumptions explicit. So even if they're wrong, at least people can see what they are. Now, do I want you to provide the uh, causal model as a string, which you know, is visible on the left there? And it looks a bit complicated, so I'll just sort of break it down so we can understand how it works. The first part is essentially we're declaring the variables. And if you remember, I said that the variables are essentially just the relevant, you, know, you don't have to use all of them, the relevant columns in your data file. So you can see the variables are essentially the columns there. And um, it's the, in, this, in this string, we essentially just declare them all by listing them by name. And um, once we've declared the variables, the next step is to create the edges in our graph. And um, you know, a good starting point is basically to say, well, in this case, there is an edge, there is a causal effect between the, whether the participant uh, received the training course and their wage. Now, in this case, that's a direct effect. It doesn't have to be. It might be that you know, doing training affects some other variable, and that other variable affects wages. But in this case, it's direct. And to explain to do why that you've got this direct effect, you just use this arrow operator you can see in the red box on the left. The, so having, having sort of created that first edge, we can just sort of keep populating the graph with all the other edges just by sort of adding them to that string. So in the next one, we sort of consider, well, what's the impact of you know, the number of years education that person has had? And you sort of consult with your experts, and they say, oh, yeah, well, that would affect you know, wages as well. And uh, actually, in this study, it affected whether people were eligible for the training program as well. So we sort of represent that by adding those two edges there. 
And then the rest of the string is essentially just repeating that and adding all of the other edges. And I don't claim this is like a, a correct causal diagram. This is you know, just an example. But um, you know, essentially, it's a representation of the string on the left there. So that was the first step. And that was like really like the, the bulk of the work that you have to do as a user of the do y library. Uh, once you've, you've created that, that graph as a string and you've got your data as a pandas data frame, you essentially pass them both into an object that do y calls a causal model. And you say, the treatment here is the training variable, and the outcome is, is these, the wages in 1978. And you pass in the data and your graph. That's it for the first step. The second step is then we do a thing called identify effect. All of the remaining steps are literally just one function call. It's, like, it's actually very easy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like using identify effect will produce a thing called an S demand, which you may not have heard of before. Essentially, an S demand is a way to estimate the desired quantity. So it's, it's a sort of it's a strategy or like a procedure that will enable you to calculate the the the, the quantity that you're interested in. And it's worth noting that it's not always possible. So you can create a graph where there is no valid estimate. It's also possible to create a graph where there are multiple estimates, in which case it will return them all and you can choose between them. So in this case, we've got a backdoor estimate. And the other thing that's happening under the hood when DoY is doing this identification step is it's analyzing the graph, that domain knowledge that you've provided, and it's working out the roles of all the variables in this problem. And, and this is a really key step, right? Because it's understanding which variables you should be controlling or conditioning for, and also which variables you should not be conditioning for. And that's really interesting, because some people sort of kind of think, well, I should just control for as many variables as possible. But that's actually harmful in, in, some, in some situations, and can actually sort of eliminate or, or bias incorrectly the effect that you're looking for. So that, that sort of analysis of the graph is really important. And to sort of illustrate you know, the, the effect that, that that can have, there's this, this phenomenon known as Simpson's paradox. And uh, in Simpson's paradox, what happens is you've got this, this whole study population where you know, the relationship between some property x and some property y has a certain you know, direction. So you can see this strong magenta line there, basically saying like, uh, an increase in x decreases the value of y. And that is true over the whole population. But if you bring in this additional variable, which actually divides the population into these four colored groups, then within each of those groups, the relationship between x and y is completely opposite. So if you hadn't brought in and controlled for that variable appropriately, then your conclusion would have been the opposite of what it should be. Now, hopefully, that sort of intuitively makes sense. It, it, in this example, you can kind of see how that works. But without the coloring, it's actually really hard to grasp how two totally different contradictory outcomes can be possible in, in one set of data. The next of our th third of our sort of four steps is uh, estimating the effect. Yeah, again, it's just a, a single function call. It's very easy to do. You can select from a range of models that are built in and supported by do y, and you can also access models from the econ ML package as well. And um, so having done this in our data set, we get this result that the causal estimate is 1629. And in this case, it's 1629 dollars more. And because we've got a causal model, we can actually make a causal interpretation, which we can say, you know, as an, given as a prior sort of assumption, that graph, that, that domain knowledge that we provided, if you accept that as being correct, then on average, completing this training course causes participants to earn $1,629 more than not completing the training. All right, so you see, you know, by bringing the sort of causal analysis and the causal model into the study, we're able to go from a sort of a statement about you know, one variable being associated with another to actually a sort of causal interpretation. The, the next and sort of final step in the, in the do why paradigm, sort of how to handle causal inference, inference, is refutation. And basically, that means sort of stress testing your uh, your model to sort of see, is this a, a real effect? Like, you might not really be sure from the magnitude of the variables whether this is like a, you know, a weak effect but legitimate, or maybe it's a strong effect, but it's sort of like biased or confounded in some way. And so DoY provides a number of tools to enable you to sort of gain confidence and sort of understand you know, how statistically robust that effect is. 
And um, you can access all of them through the refute estimate function. You basically specify the name of the test that you want to do. So in this case, you can see what I've done is I've used a placebo treatment, which essentially means we randomize all of the treatments, but we keep the outcomes and all the other variables the same. And because we've randomized the treatment, we would expect that effect to disappear. And in this case, fortunately, it does. The effect has gone down from $1,600 to just $2. So it's pretty much gone. Now, there's one extra bit that I wanted to sort of add to this talk, which is about counterfactual outcomes. So a counterfactual outcome is like looking back and saying, well, what would have happened if, if things were different, like if we did something differently? And you know, the great thing about having a causal model is we can, actually, we can actually answer this, right? So we can first look at what actually did happen to the participants in this study. And so the red box at the bottom shows that if you look at the average outcome over all the participants, it's $5,300 average wage in 1978. Been a lot of inflation since then. And um, if we look at the outcome for just the control group who didn't receive the training, it's the average wage is $4,500. And the average outcome for the treated group who did receive the training is $6,300. So yeah, at, at surface level, it looks like you know, there was uh, an increase in wage for that group, which matches our sort of causal effect that doing the training did increase their wage. So that's all looking good. So DoY provides this thing called the Do Operator, and that is a way to access an intervention or to uh, apply a counterfactual scenario. And so uh, to illustrate that, I've added a couple of extra outcomes. So firstly, the outcome over all the participants, if, if none of them received any training, the average outcome goes down from 5,300 and it goes down to 4,600. So you can see that if we take away the training, then all the participants kind of become more like the controls. And we also have a counterfactual outcome, as if we, if we did provide training to all the participants. So that increases the average wage to 6,200. And those numbers kind of make sense, right? Because they look, it basically it makes the population look more like the, you know, the, the population who did receive training, or we can make the population look more like the ones who didn't. And um, that's really the sort of, you know, one of the key powers of this is that it, it enables you to um, answer questions like, well, what if we rolled out that program more widely? Like, what if we replaced all of these old devices with some new device? You know, what would actually happen? And this allows us to sort of answer those questions. Before I wrap up, just want to quickly mention an app that, um, that I created based on, based on the DoY library. And, um, and really, this app, aims to make some of the topics we talked about today, like causality, accessible to a wider audience. And uh, specifically, like trying to sort of you know, make these techniques available to scientists and uh, you know, engineers and, and other people who aren't necessarily data scientists or Python developers. So they're not able to sort of access you know, libraries like DoY directly. And that app includes a causal diagram editor that enables you to sort of explore you know, how different sort of models of your system would be represented and how you can use them in your studies. So that pretty much wraps things up. Um, I hope I've sort of made you, at least made you intrigued about you know, causality and causal inference. I mean, I, I believe that we should be using these methods more widely, sort of discussing them, sort of thinking about cause and effect, and explicitly in a lot of, especially observational studies. There is this particular opportunity we're seeing where you know, these organizations have a huge amount of historical data and they've got that detailed domain knowledge that so makes it very sort of accessible there. And if you're thinking about doing uh, causal inference, then I recommend do why. It's um, under active development, it's easy to use. Um, and yeah, as mentioned, the code for this talk is available um, in the link there. Thanks for listening.